And yes, for a while, I suppose, we can kind of come and go in our closeness to God. But ultimately, God wants us to be close to Him, doing good will, doing good work, loving others, sharing in His love. Paul continues saying, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. This goes right along with what he's just said, especially since you're related to Christ. Honor means to show reverence. It's not easy. Many in our world today believe the opposite that we ought to seek admiration and status within our community of peers. Paul continues by saying, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Forty years ago, I met a person who would become a friend for life. He and I met at college. When I lived in Maine, we would get together every once in a while. But I haven't seen him for 15 years since moving to Massachusetts. He's one I would say never lacks in zeal for the Lord. He and his wife both were feel, filled with this zeal and this sense of just living life for everything it can be. But he would always ask everyone he met, do they know the Lord as their Savior? When did you accept the Lord into your heart? And they would press and press to anybody that they would meet. But they never showed it in how they lived their lives. They would just, you just had to be saved. And then you were all right. Nothing, nothing more. I don't think they're in sync with what Paul is talking about, being having that fervor, having that zeal to serve the Lord. Not what I would say to be in sync with God's purposes for our lives. In verses 12 and 13, Paul challenges each of us to live a life, giving life in the presence of conflict. Be joyful, he says. Patient in affliction. Faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. This is especially difficult to do if we harbor a grudge against someone. It's hard to practice hospitality. It's hard to want to be around them. But these three ideas that Paul is presenting form a simple guide to good Christian living. Be joyful in hope. God is doing a good work in you. Do not fret. Give it to God and let God deal with the issues. Patient in affliction. You'll get through it because God is always with you. And you believe that. So just hang in tight. And faithful prayer? Make your communion with God a priority. If we can do these three things, then what follows in the remaining verses comes a little easier. The next one, the one that's probably the hardest. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. This is about as countercultural thinking as we can get. But if you have God's eternal perspective, you'll discover that it becomes easier to love those who hate you. Again. Not easy, given the social context 
and circumstances that we live in. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. As God shapes your character and shapes your being, you begin to respond differently to problems and circumstances. It's okay to be happy, and it's okay to be sad sometimes. You know that saying that if you're a Christian, you're going to be happy all the time? You ever heard that? It's one of those things that my friend in Maine used to say. I don't think it's necessarily true. I often think about Jesus' journey on earth. Scriptures reveal that Jesus experienced many emotions. He was not Mr. Joyful Jesus all the time. He had moments of anger, of pain, of anger, frustration, along with moments of delight and joy. Paul goes on to say, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited, or haughty, as in this translation. In other words, be of the same mind. Focus on the same goal, serving God. Being transformed into his image. And then share his love with the world. Where did Jesus minister? Where did he sit and dine? Not with the elite, but rather with the downtrodden, the sick and the hurting, the sinners of his time. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is, what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And Paul takes it one step further in the next few verses. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, and this is hard. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will be keeping burning coals upon his head. How easy it is to want revenge when someone hurts us, or someone we love, or someone takes advantage, or betrays a loved one. The taught cultural response is, you're going to pay. They're going to pay. But think about it. Who really suffers the most when you have that attitude? The Avenger must think, plan, and carry out the, the revenge. It's contrary to what God says in his word. The avenger becomes the subject of God's wrath. God says, feed your enemy. Give them something to drink. It's so contrary to our thinking. But it is in keeping with God's way. I was working with a person when I was at the Florence Congregational Church. she harbored a grudge against another member of the church to the point that almost every time we had any interconnection, she would bring up the sin of that other person, the problem of that other person. She thought about it constantly, day after day after day. Would you, you know what? Oh, did you see that? She focused all of her energy all of her thinking, all of her being, 
on that person's problem. So one day I went to the person and I said something to the effect that, you know, this other person is really upset and, you know, you, you two have had this thing going on for a long time. Could you, um, can you tell me what it's about? And she says, yeah. She caught me running in the aisle of the church. And running is not allowed in the sanctuary. This person has gone on weeks on, on end, confronting me, this person needs to be dealt with, it's a big problem. I wouldn't tell me what the problem was, but this person was a real problem in the church. For running in the aisle of the church. Down and done. She didn't even remember running down the aisle initially. But it it, it finally came up. Who was that was frustrating and complaining and just upset all the time. She couldn't let it go. It was burning up all her energy. It was continually, it was taking over her life. Paul sums it up. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. She could have taken a totally different route, totally different perspective. It wasn't a wrong act. It wasn't an evil act. It was a simple misunderstanding. But it consumed her. Paul says the Lord is calling us to Christ, to a Christ-centered character that is in keeping with our Savior's own words. They will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. They will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. Instead of returning evil for evil, we bless. That's who we are as Christians. We bless by doing good, by forgiving, by loving. So no matter what our human will might be saying, I'm going to get you, but they're going to pay. We need to figure out a way to show kindness, to show compassion, to show love, to show others that God really does love us and love them and accepts them for who they are through his son. I want to close by suggesting that when we love, we worship God. When we love one another, we are showing our worship of God. We're showing that we understand God's love must, must be extended. You see, worship is so much more than what we do here on a Sunday morning. We should live our lives in worship all the time, in worship mode all the time. Every thought, every word, every action reflects your worship of God, your love of your Heavenly Father. With this practice, there's no room for hate or revenge. We become fully engaged in God's being. We become one in God's love. Paraphrasing the poet Susan Schultz, love is the source of strength. Love is the source of reality. Love is the source of unity. Love is the source of success. Love is the source of future. Love is the source of passion. Love is the source of sharing. Love is the source of security. Love is the source of love. May God love and bless you fully 
as you go from this place. Amen.